Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to another Critique of the Week. So glad you could join me. It is July 15th, the Rattle Poetry Prize deadline. Um, if you haven't gotten your submissions in yet, you have about, uh, what, 15 hours to get those in. Um, let's see. Who do we got here? Let me know if uh, YouTube is working, because it says that it's getting no data, but the stream is showing. So something's wrong with, fa- with YouTube's uh, interface here. So uh, let's see. So Nate Jacobs here and Katie Dozier's here. Clayton Clark, James Langford. Tom Barlow, Cindy Gore, good to see you all. Dick Westheimer, good to see you too. Um, yes, yeah, some, someone make sure, tell me it's working because it doesn't, it, it's acting like it's not even though it is. So I think it is. Um, let's see, over on Facebook, we have, uh, we got Josh Williams and Susan uh, Naimi and uh, Jenny Middleton, Sharon Ferrante, good to see you all. Okay. Um, YouTube's working. Okay, good. Thanks, Katie. So, um, yeah, so today's the Rattle Poetry Prize deadline, so I thought maybe uh, you'd like to know what it's like for me, because um, the thing is, the Rattle Poetry Prize raises a lot of the money that we do for extra stuff throughout the entire year. So what I do, I just sit here at my computer all day, whatever the deadline is, I can't help it, and I look at this one number. I'll show you right here. This is our, uh, our submittable page, and these are the number of submissions so far. 2932. So for every uh for every Rattle Poetry Prize entry, um about 12 bucks goes to the subscription, about um uh you know, a couple bucks goes to credit card processing and things like that. And then we make about $10 um extra um for each submission, but then the prize money is $25,000 total. So, if you do the math there, we need uh 2500 to break even and not lose money on the contest. So, um and everybody submits the last day. That's the thing. Um and uh, so I'm always checking this. And when we hit that 2,500, I breathe a big sigh of relief. And then I keep refreshing this page. And um, if we hit, I think we had we 28. Um, 2,800 is the replacement level for subscribers. So as long as we make 2,800, um, we will have more, you know, as many subscribers as we usually do to the magazine, which is good too. Because, we, you know, we want to spread poetry around. And then when we hit up to like 35, which is like the goal... Um, that funds Poets Respond and the Ekphrastic Challenge and things like that where we pay poets, but it doesn't really generate any revenue. So, um, And the uh, Neil Postman will for Metaphor, too. So those are the kind of targets I'm hoping to hit. Those are the things that funds is like paying poets. I mean, the whole thing funds paying poets or you getting poetry. Um, but anyway, that is what I do all day, just watching that number. So we'll see where it is at the end. It's 2932. It's amazing how fast they come in this last day. Um, like we get 1,000 entries the last day. Um, but anyway, that is where we are. But let's get into a critique of the week. And as always, the uh, purpose is to give that workshop experience to people. It's like a MFA program they can have from uh, your your phone or your living room. And uh, we have th- um, a little different. We have uh, three poets today because we had the second poet that I randomly picked um, using the random number generator um, only had one poem. So then I looked for a poet who had either one poem or two short poems. So we have another poet who has two short poems. So we'll be looking at three poets, five poems, um, three of them, or most of them are pretty short. Um, but as always, we want to give that, you know, the workshop experience, which is to let strangers, let, let the writer know what strangers think about their work. So uh, so leave as many comments as you can, and I will pass them along and, and comment on them and, and share. Um, they can read comments too. So, so leave as many comments as you can for the poets so they know um, how poetry, how, how their poems are landing for you. Um, and now the first poet here is, uh, is Christine Penny Legion. And she's got some uh, blank verse poems, which are pretty interesting. So let's take a look right now. This is um, yeah, Christine Penny Legion. And this is Kids Will Ruin Your Figure. And uh, you just see that it's uh, 14 lines. You can kind of just, if you, if you read enough poems, you can go, oh, that's a sonnet length. And that's actually a blank verse sonnet because there's no rhyme. So let's see. My body has been shaped by this. It's true. The record of their ten- tenant, <laughs> the record of their tena- tenancies. Tenancies is a strange word. I keep wanting to say tendencies. Let me start over again. I did that in my head when I read it a, little, a couple minutes ago. For the first time, my body has been shaped by this, it's true. The record of their tenancies reveals a hundred wandering silver scars that lie on widened hip and belly, soft and slack, a pitch and jutting navel, tired knees, two breasts that fill and empty like the tide. But witness is not borne by me alone. Our fingerprints, they say, are slowly formed, not only at genetics beck and call, but as we touch and grasp the secret world where we begin. 
Each whirl and arch is made as fingers blindly reach to hold the cord of life, the muscled walls that keep us safe. And if you, and if I have been marked, then so have they. So that is, uh, kids will ruin your figure. And, and I just, you know, I really love, you know, people say that they get upset that we don't publish enough formal poems, but it's only because people don't submit them very often. I love formal poetry. I just love feeling that cadence, um, the cadence there. And, um, so, and, and this is the, the heart of the poem here is this idea that our fingerprints are made by pushing against the walls of the, the womb and, and the umbilical cord. I didn't know that. So it's a fascinating detail to write a poem about perfect for the size of a uh, sonnet form. Um, so kids will ruin your figure. My body has been shaped by this. It's true. So great. You know, my body has been shaped by this. It's true. Just great. Nice blank verse there. Um, you can feel the, the iambic feet. The record of their tenancies reveals a hundred wandering silver scars that lie on widened hip and belly, soft and slack. Yeah. Um, let's see. Dick Westheimer says it's. Is there an it's that's wrong somewhere? Probably. The first one's. That's the right. That's um, Somewhere there's probably an, an it's. We'll, we'll come across it. And a there, too? Hmm. Yeah, we'll, we'll come across it. It's true. Hmm. I'm not sure what, what you're referring to, Dick, but I'll, I'll figure it out. Um, anyway, the record of their tendencies reveals a hundred wandering silver scars. This is the first time. So I love the first three lines. I think they work really great. They really get you into the rhythm. Um, and let's see. So Katie Dozier says maybe change tendencies to vacancies. How does that sound? My body has been shaped by this. It's true. The record of their vacancies reveals a hundred wandering. Hmm. I don't know. It sounds better. It's much, tendencies is such a, it's a weird word. I know it's a real word, but it's not one you see, you know, conjugated like that. You know, tendencies is such, so much more common. Um, I don't know how often, I don't know. I mean, you can't really assume people are going to misread your poems, but they kind of will. And and maybe that's just me that keeps mis, mis saying that. Um, and I also, out of the corner of my eye, I feel like it's, um, cause you, you kind of do read, like you read, you focus on one word, but you're sort of anticipating the next and, and seeing it out of the corner of your eye as you move. And I even think of it as it might be tentacles. So it's a weird word, um, tenancies. But vacancies, I think, is the opposite meaning, you know? So their um, the record of their being gone is not the same thing as their record of being there. So I think, I mean, tenancies, tenancies is the right word. Um, it's just kind of a, a hard word to say and fit in there. I trip over it. Um, so maybe think of a different way. Um, um, the record of their occupancy, the record of their occupancy. <laughs> no, that's too many. Occupation. The, yeah, Dick, yeah, the, record of, the record of their occupation reveals. Yeah, the occupation would work. Um, Cindy Gore says, I love how I was surprised by the tenderness of the poem after seeing the title. Yeah, yeah, I do too. It's really, it is really a, a touching, tender kind of poem. So the, the, the first word I would change. So tendencies, I would kind of find it better, a different word, just because I trip. Maybe it's just me though. Um, residencies. I think residencies is too many syllables. That's that's Tom Barlow's suggestion, though. Um, but anyway, a hundred wandering silver scars that lie. This is the first part where I feel like um, something was, it was squeezed in to fit the form, to fit the meter, on widened hip and belly. You know, um, you know. Normally, it's much more natural to say something like a um, hundred wandering silver scars that lie on widening hips and or something like that. The, the lack of article two. Um, um, and the lack of reference. There's like a way that it's like stilted, the way it jumps right to the, the word there and, and sort of squeezes the, the syllables. Um, so I think this line, I would work on that a little bit to make it feel more natural. Uh, I think that's the only, I think there are only two lines, I think maybe in the whole thing, maybe only one that, that feel that way, but, but make this more natural, I would say. Uh, the speech, I mean. Um, yeah. Um, on widened hip and belly, soft and slack, a pitch and jutting navel, tired knees, two breasts that fill and empty like the tide. Um, Belladonna suggests a record of their fecundity. That's interesting, too. The record of their fecundity. Ah, that's too many syllables, too. The record maybe just of fecundity. Um, yeah. 
The record of their tendencies reveals a hundred wandering silver scars that lie on, yeah, I mean, you want like my in there or something, on my widening hips, belly, soft and slack, a pitch and jutting navel, tired knees, two breasts that fill and empty like the tide. And there's a great way. So we have these great um, ways that break up the meter. They're just the meter's done really well here. So we have these great, um, you know, these commas and these asides break up the meter. And then you get this last one that rolls through to the period. So it's got great sounds in it too. You can just feel that. Even though even though I, I think that this is a little unnatural, the rest of the sentence is great. Soft and slack, a pitch and jutting navel, tired knees, two breasts that fill and empty like the tide. The way that rolls out of your mouth it's just great. So that's a great line, too. Um, and then we get the turn a little earlier than a regular turn, but it's good still. Um, but witness is not borne by me alone. Our fingerprints, they say, are slowly formed, not only at, at genetics beck and call, but as we touch and grasp the secret world where we begin, each whirl and arch is made as fingers blindly reach to hold the cord of life. Again, this is great. I love this, too. Very well. Just the meter, is, it works really well here. Um, and it and it draws you through the poem. It, it feels like it, the poet knows what they're doing, which is just what great meter does. Um, his fingers blindly reach to hold the cord of life, the muscled walls that keep us safe. Um, and if I have been marked, then so have they. And that the one thing, so I think this poem, with a couple little tweaks to these spots right here, um, I think it's great. Um, the only thing that sort of leaves it a little flat to me is the ending. Um, I think... I think you could come up with something better. I don't think this is quite the ending to me. It's, it just feels kind of flat and understated where it wants to push a little farther. Um, you know, like, like, I guess what it is, is it, and if I have been marked, then so have they. That doesn't really add something. Um, and I want, I want it, that last line feels like it wants to, to, to move in a different direction instead of summarize. And I kind of feel like that's what it is. So, you know, like we had this realization that it's actually um, a tender thing, as someone said. I like that word. Um, uh, but then we get, and so we, we get that turn. We get what this poem's about. And then this last line just kind of like restates it. Um, and um, I think maybe, I'm not sure exactly what to do, but I think there's something that, something more. I would just work on this line, try to make, what I like to do, um, or at least used to when I wrote a lot, was I like to actually just write out the whole poem. And then when I get to the line that I'm stuck at, so at the, at the safe, you know, and I feel like I want something, then I just write whatever comes to mind without thinking. I try to like use the typing um, to be, um, you know, sort of get me in a subconscious mode. So I'm not really paying attention and I'm letting my thoughts wander a little bit as I go. And then sometimes your subconscious will spit out something interesting for that last line where it really wants to go. And that's what I would, I, I would try to do that there or something. Cause I feel like this is just a little flatter and the poem could really jump out and be great instead of just good. If we could do something about that last line and make it more interesting. Um, Dequan, most time I mentioned is great enjambment. And yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, this poem moves, if you want to know how to do meter really well, um, you know, and these could, these end rhymes could rhyme or not. There's some, some internal rhymes in here too that work well. Um, but, but the way that the, the meter pushes and pulls against the line breaks is just wonderful. You know, I mean, the reason why people I think don't like, um, you know, some people just say they hate rhyme and meter is because it gets very repetitive. Um, and, and so pushing against these, using and jamming a lot, um, breaks out of that, but, but then he keeps the, the echo of confidence in the background. Um, Nate Jacobs says, I really want the last line to tie mother to child beyond the umbilical cord. Yeah. Like it just wants to go somewhere like, like extra, um, you know, so, somewhere farther. Um, Duke Westheimer says the cord of life is a bit cliche. What about excising that line so that the poet has two lines to use to land the poem? That's a good idea too. Um, Yeah, I mean, you could just stop it at chord and then not say of life, and then you'd have the whole two lines. That's a good suggestion. I, I like that. Um, let me go look over to... Yeah, so Mark, uh, Mike Griffith agrees about tendencies. Um,
Yeah, so Sharon Frentis says, but witness is not born by me alone. That would be a nice ending. Replace it with something else. I can't write in this form. I admire the poet. Wonderful. Yeah, it's good stuff. Um, Chrissy Stegman says, the last line, I think she means, could show um, um, what was at stake for the poem. Yeah, exactly. There's just something a little bit, like it, it, just, it just ends sort of too abruptly almost. Um... So uh, Karen Marker says residence reveals instead of tenen- tenancies. Residence is a good word too, yeah. The record of the residence. Actually, that that fits. The record of the residence reveals. Yeah, I think that that might be the, the word. I don't good good job. I don't know why I hadn't thought of that. My my body has been shaped by this. It's true. The record of the residence reveals a hundred wandering silver scars that lie on wide. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Um else so nate jacobs is a disagreement it's good to get disagreement in too um nate jacob about the tenancies uh just jumped on me where to go he said that he liked it um it's about the habitation not the absence yeah as, as opposed to vacancies yeah but i think residence works well too um i mean it's one of those things where the um the the you, you know, you have to balance the um, the and tr- we have a translation issue coming up, and that's the thing translators always have to do is balancing the sound and the way that it's it's it feels and sounds when you come across it versus the literal meaning. Because when you translate a poem, a lot of the translation changes the music, and you can't have a literal translation um, and still keep the music. So you have to balance the music versus the meaning. And tendencies is the best word. It's just you trip over it. Um. Yeah. Okay, um, let me see. Yeah, Nate Jacobian says, I do like the poem. I just want the final line or two to tie an apron string back around the child. That's a good way to put it, to keep the child close. Yeah, I agree. I like that. So so hopefully we gave you some things to think about just for the ending. This poem is very close. I mean, a couple tiny tweaks and then and, and just the ending, the last line, I think could be better. I think it's totally, you know, I think someone will publish it. That's one of the things that you... um. I don't know. It's another thing you have to think about as an editor too, or just as yourself submitting. Like a lot of times, you know, things can be published, and and I think um, I think if it's this poem was submitted places places that appreciated you know blank verse at least, um, you know, it might it might be published um in this form without any changes, um, but the poem could still be better if it you know could raise its level. It could become even better um if you've changed that last line. So sometimes publication is premature. With my book, um. Um, American Fractal, which I, you know, I enjoyed putting together and stuff. Um, you know, I was, it, it was rejected or, you know, not accepted by the first couple of presses I sent it to. And then I completely changed it and, you know, I shuffled a lot of things. It's so much better because of the rejection. Um, if, if somebody has accepted it the first time, it wouldn't be as good. And I think the same thing happens with individual poems all the time. And once they're, once they're published, we kind of think of them as done. And um, they're not, you know, they could be even better. So anyway... Uh, that is uh, the first poem, Kids Will Ruin Your Figure. Now, we have some kind of short poems still. Let's move through. Um, Dick Westheimer says, Able Muse would love this. I love Able Muse. Um, Able Muse is a website. It's run by, um, oh, what's his name? Alex, um, starts with a P. I can't remember right now. Um, Peppel, Peppel. And um, and it's a, it's a literary magazine, but there's a great forum. So if you love, it's sort of like the nexus of formal poets. There are, there are a couple like communities, almost like the haiku people have their haiku foundation and things like that, and, and Grace Guts. Um, for formal poetry, Able Muse is the best place to go. There's a message board where people share and critique poems. Um, I think they call it the Eratosphere. Um, and then there's um, the magazine, and they publish books. I think, um, is this? So this guest on the Rattlecast this coming up week is... Um, you can see here. I'll put it on the screen. This is dark under dark water, surviving the Titanic. At the end of the show, you will see um, Anna Evans' little little preview. But uh, this is published by Able Muse Press, ablemuse.com. And and so um, and she's a formal poet. Um, so they publish books um, that have formal elements, um, and, and they're great great books. Alex Peppel does a wonderful job. So um, anyway, that's Able Muse, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if Christine um, spends a lot of time there. Because uh, you know, she's a good formalist. Okay, so let's d- d- get to the other poem for uh, from uh, Christine. This is ten twenty eighteen. 
um, 10, 2018. Ocean City in October. We labor on deserted sands to build our summer home. Fat toddler hands pat walls and lumpy strongholds into being. We gather shells to decorate, fortify with sticks, fly seaweed banners bravely. A moat takes shape to guard against the rising tide. Overnight it laps closer and closer, lifting the proverbial boats as we dream our salt or sea salt dreams. We do not hear the walls collapse. We do not hear a thing. So again, this is great. Um, yeah. Um, so again, the... Um, you know, when somebody knows how to write in meter and, and actually use those poetic verse devices, even though I don't think this is meter, unless it's just some meter I'm not recognizing, um, but you can still feel the feet in the rhythm of um, of meter coming through. This is what people would call free verse back when, um, um, you know, now free verse is, is sort of um, even looser than this, but this is free verse in the free way, you know, Um in the uh, William Carlos Williams way, where where actually the lines are metered, they're just not regularly patterned. Um, so the first off, the first thing that was the title, um, 10, 18, or, or 10, 2018, um, that, that just means nothing to me. So it's, I don't think it's a very good title. I mean, it might be, it might mean something to you. I'm, I'm sure it does. Um, and I think probably it's a hurricane that came through the Ocean City shore. But that would be a day or two. It wouldn't be the whole month. Um, so, so I think that um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. So I was wondering if there's any kind of way that this is two is a is a fourteen line sonnet, but it's not. So I would make this the title. Um, I think this works better, and then you can have the uh, twenty eighteen as a, as a little epigram. So, you know, it's Ocean City in October, um, either in, in the title 2018 or just underneath like italicized or something, 2018. And that, and that's just a much better title. It's more evocative. The The date itself, I mean, I know like once we uh, once we see what the poem's about, we kind of assume that's what it is. I, I would have to look up which hurricane it was that, that, that went through. But I think a hurricane went through and, and wrecked the, the shore and a lot of houses and things with a, with a big, um, you know, the big... Uh, Storm surge and, and things like that. But you wouldn't look at it in the table of contents. That just means nothing to you, and it doesn't really add anything. It's not evocative. So I, th- I would make Ocean City in October the title. I think that would be better. And then we labored on desert sand, deserted sands to build our summer home. Fat toddler hands pat walls and lumpy strongholds into being. So they're just great, great rhyme, like internal rhymes here too, um, and, and great sounds. We gather shells to decorate, fortify with sticks, fly seaweed banners bravely. So it just paints the scene very nicely. So so it's good stuff. Like you know, good way to get into the poem. A moat takes shape to guard against the rising tide. Um, overnight it laps closer and closer, lifting the proverbial boats. I think proverbial. Um, I don't know. I think it's a little too. Uh, I don't know, it feels clunky. That's the one word that feels clunky there. Overnight it laps closer and closer, lifting the proverbial proverbial boats as we dream our sea sea salt dreams Um, we do not hear the walls collapse we do not hear a thing and there's a great really subtle internal rhyme there between dreams and thing um yeah we dream our sea salt dreams says clayton clark yeah that's a great line she uh, clayton loves this one too yeah this is really good so this poem um again it's really tight and concise um and I think, you know, we, we set up, you know, we, we've bought this house, we, we're putting it together, um, you know, getting ready, f- you know, making it a home, I guess, um, or at least a summer home anyway. And then, um, and then this comes, you know, the hurricane, the, the storm surge comes. Um, and, and really, it's all made to get to this ending. Um, it's one of those poems where it's sort of um, um, a setup and punchline type structure, where we sort of like paint the scene here. And really, the whole poem is in service to get this really great ending. So Tom Barlow said it was Hurricane Florence, but that was September 2018. Hmm. So I don't know. Interesting. So so I'm not sure what, if it's not referring to a hurricane, um, then I'm not sure what it's referring to. Was it just a high tide event? Hmm. 
Um, Vina Kumar says it's so silent at the end. Another wonderful poem. Yeah, it, it is. I think that's really wonderful. And really, like Clayton Clark pointed out, it's this, as we dream our seesaw dreams. Like, you can just imagine, um, you know, the, the good feelings and then nature coming and, and having, you know, it, it's, um, you know. So Hurricane Irma, says Belladonna. What is Hurricane Irma? Hurricane Maria. How many hurricanes are there? Um, Hurricane Maria, could that be? Um, that was September 2017. So um, um, Ed Goldman says not a real house, just a sandcastle perhaps. It maybe, maybe... Um, Yeah, I mean, it, it could be, I, I felt like that was sort of a metaphor or, um, and that's not right, the right word, metonymous for um, for the, the actual house. So I thought that was being used to describe it as if it were like a sandcastle, but it was really a summer house. Um, yeah. Hmm. Anyway, yeah, so, so Katie Dozer says there was a bad Florida hurricane then. Um, and maybe the storm surge got all the way up to Maryland. Yeah. I don't know. Well, anyway, whatever it was, so I'm not sure, maybe we're not, maybe the title can give us a little more information so we don't have to wonder about that as much. Um, but the point is the whole poem works to this great ending, and I just love this sort of, I mean, there's a real sort of deep resonance to it, because that's how life is. Like, you think everything is settled, you know, you think you've done a good job and you're happy and then secretly, who knows what's lurking around the corner? Um, you know, what, what seawall is about to collapse um, and, and you don't even hear it when it happens. And, and there's something that really resonates with that, I think. It's a great little metaphor for the way life works and how you always have to be prepared, really, um, or, or ready to adapt because things can change in a moment. So, um, and it's really just wonderfully put our, as we dream our sea salt dreams, we do not hear the walls collapse. We do not hear a thing. And it's that thing dream. If it was a, if it was a true rhyme, it wouldn't work as well, I think. But the slant rhyme there, just, it's a really great ending. Um, so I think it works pretty well. The only thing I, the only real advice I have maybe is proverbial boats. I think that's a bit of a tongue twister and, um, you know, and lifting boats is a bit of a cliche. Um, and I think the proverbial is there to sort of hedge against the cliche um, so this line, I think, you know, work this line, you know, say that in an interesting, different way. Um, I think, you know, having the cliche that you hedge against, it doesn't really live up to the rest of the poem. But, um, and then the title, um, just a better title gives us a little more information and, and makes it more, makes us want to read the poem. A point of the title, one of them should be that when you see it, it makes you want to read the poem. I mean, that, that's a, a thing that a title can do. And this doesn't really give us a whole lot. Um, so, so better title in that one line. Otherwise, it's, I think it's great. So two really good poems here from Christine um, Penny Legion. Thanks for sharing those, Christine. And um, I think she said she's not home right now. We'll have to watch this later. Or maybe that was the next. Um, this is... Um, how do you say, is that uh, Jean or Jean or Jean? How do you pronounce that name? I mean, the one, <laughs> the one I know that has that name is, is Jean. Does everybody say it like Jean, though? Hmm. Well, anyway, um, Jean will say Blum or Jean. And we have this just one poem here. Some things shift. Yeah, something shift. And this is after the hours by Michael Cunningham. A genie says Dick Westheimer. So you pronounce that genie? Or Jean? Really, I thought if it was, I mean, we, I don't know. I thought if it was, uh, I thought it's just G-E-A-N was Jean. it be genie. I don't know. Anyway, something shift after the hours by Michael Cunningham. When my friend handed me his copy of the hours, I didn't know then it was a setup. He just said the writing was beautiful. He knew that I'd read some Virginia Woolf, though not Mrs. Dalloway. He knew I was struggling in my marriage. Propped up on pillows, alone in bed, that week I read the novel. It was beautiful, but its plots pained me, especially the young boy who made his mother into a monster for life, for leaving to save herself, for not realizing she couldn't survive if she'd stayed. 
One morning, as I lay in bed, with eyes closed, my snoring husband next to me, I felt surfaced from deep inside the silent scream, I want to divorce. Later, I texted my friend for his whereabouts, Starbucks. I found him there with his usual French press. The ro he rose to greet me in the middle of the coffee shop. He held me as I sobbed. Eventually, my friend and I had coffee. Eventually, I filed for divorce. Eventually, my son forgave me for not taking me with him with me. Ten years later, I told my friend for a second that day I'd felt ambushed. He explained, once someone gave him the hours, that it had righted his course, that you have to decide to stay in that time of unhappiness or be brave enough to start over. One second. Let's read that again. To stave, let's see where it is. Um, you have to decide to stay in that time of unhappiness or be brave enough to start over. A friend can't tell you what to do, just lead you toward your own vision. To arrive in that moment when all pieces align, then something shifts. So, um, so that is the poem. Something, something shift. Um, After the Hours by Michael Cunningham. And there's an interesting phenomenon that uh, that happens here. I feel like this is a better ending than the last paragraph, or the last stanza. A friend can't tell you what to do. This kind of explains what's going on. Um, it's funny, Belladonna really loves Criminal Coffee Company. It's the second time she's mentioned it. Thanks for mentioning that, but I'll have to look it up. Um, she says, Criminal Coffee Company makes better coffee than Folgers in a French press. Um, so, yeah, so, so there's a weird thing that happens. This happens in submissions all the time where, uh, we'll print, we'll print out a poem. We'll be talking at a meeting and we're like, oh, that's a good poem. And then you get to the second page and you're like, oh, it just should have ended there. And it's, it tells you really something that you could probably do all the time. Um, when you finish with a poem, you know, set it aside, look at it. And then, you know, when you've kind of forgotten enough about it to, to look at it again with kind of fresh eyes, just like hold up a paper and like cut off the bottom and see, you know, where a better ending is. Like, is this a better ending? A lot of times we just explain away the um, the ending too. Um, you know, it's just a tendency we have. Like we think like, oh, they're not going to get it. So let's let's make sure they do, um, you know, the reader. And so a lot of times we, we continue the poem longer than it has to be with a kind of summary. And that's what happens here. So a lot of times the last stanza, but sometimes it might be the last two, can just be cut off and it becomes a better ending where there's just more resonance because there's some ambiguity still. It kind of like is still buzzing when you're left with the poem. Um, so I think, I mean, the first off, this is, I think the end here is the, is the number one suggestion. Um, end here. And um, yeah, Jess Williams says, yeah, it's writing past the ending. Um, and to Kimberly McNeil says, end it over. Yeah, everybody agrees. Take the last stanza out. Very easy critique there. Um, and I think, yeah. And two, yeah, good point from Veena Kumar. Um, the title works even better if it's not the ending of the poem. One of the things you want, the experience you kind of want to generate when you have a poem, uh, you know, when you just, someone reads a poem that you wrote a poem is that you want people to, when they get to the end, scan back to the top and say some things shift and reread the title and maybe reread the poem again. Like that's the goal. <coughs> Sorry. So um, you want people to, to want to reread the poem again. Uh, for one thing, it'll help them. They'll, it'll be more memorable to them if they reread the title. Um, and so, you know, so this ending, you know, if you've done your job, people will just naturally do that. I think you might not even notice that you do, but I think that's what everybody does. Um, and so if you, so repeating the last line, you know, repeating the ending here, um, ends up kind of re almost like saying it twice, because if, if the poem's successful, people will come up to that and say, ah, some things shift, you know, and the title will make sense. It'll all kind of click together. But if you get to the point where you explained it in the stanza, um, then it just feels kind of redundant and, and like you overdid it. And so, so for sure, cut that ending off. Um, and the says it's a really good poem, very engaging. It's good storytelling. It's good, straightforward honesty. One of the things that uh, that we're drawn to, and I, I was thinking about this, and, and kind of the 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 conversation went went a different direction with uh, Troy Jollymore earlier on Monday's show. 
but uh, but the reason why I think that the political poems, um, it, it's t- it's hard writing political poems about things that that are you know serious political issues because you have an opinion that you're projecting, and I think the real thing that we're missing is sort of an honesty perspective to it because it's all couched in sort of talking points when you're talking about politics, and and, and persuasive writing, and and what we're really just so drawn to honesty. And just a simple story that feels really honest and authentic um, and, and true, like someone's just telling me there's truth, we're always drawn to that. That's always really engaging. So there's nothing flashy about this poem, but it is very engaging just because it tells the story very honestly. Like, I don't, I don't doubt any of this. The only thing I doubt is maybe the friend, I um, wonder if the friend had some more, uh, more intentions than just, uh, just uh, you know, helping the friend break up the marriage, but... Um, but, but as far as the storytelling goes, I don't, um, you know, I don't doubt it at all. I I feel, it feels very authentic and honest and and we're just drawn to that. That's very engaging all the time. Um, so let's look at a little more detail. Something shift. When my friend handed me his copy of the hours, I didn't know when then it was a setup. And it's a very good start because we know, you know, we get the whole kind of whole story right here, um, in a way that we're, we're drawn into it. So, uh, you know, what's this poem about? My friend had me a copy of the hours and I didn't know it was a setup. And now we know we're going to, what to expect. And so we know what the storytelling is going to be. Um, I didn't, um, he just, he just said the writing was beautiful. He knew, th- um, propped up on pillows load in bed that week. I read the novel. It was beautiful. Um, I think maybe, you know, describing it as beautiful twice is something I'd probably change. And, or maybe italicize that. Um, you know, it was beautiful to, to, to know that you're being intentionally, you know, calling yourself back to that word, but it, it's plots pained me, especially, I wonder about this line break. Like why I put the me here? Why not move the me up there? Um, it's just kind of awkward, especially the young boy who made his mother into a monster for life for leaving to save herself <clears throat> for not realizing she couldn't survive if she'd stayed. One morning, as I lay in bed with eyes closed, my snoring husband next to me, I felt surfaced from deep inside the silent scream, I want divorce. <laughs> yeah, so, so Katie Dodger says the friend sounds a bit sus. Yeah, I mean, that kind of, um, that, that's where my mind was going through the whole poem. Is, is he, you know, thinking, hey, I'll make it be a better, you know, husband than your husband. <laughs> I, you know, I just got divorced. I always liked you better than my wife. Maybe you felt the same way about me. Why don't you read the same book that, that you know, so I thought that was going this that direction. It kind of didn't. Um, yeah, sus is in suspicious. Uh, that's what the kids say. Um, anyway, one morning as I lay in bed with eyes closed, my snoring husband next to me, I felt surface, felt surface from deep inside the silent scream. That was one thing. I felt surface from deep inside the silent scream. The the way that's phrased, it's um, passive voice, and so it makes it a little confusing. Um, and, and you notice the first time I read it, I tripped over it a little bit. So I think this could be cleaned up, um, j- just reversing, you know, the silent screamed out of me or something, that, you know, just from that direction. Um, later, I texted my friend for his whereabouts, Starbucks. I found him there with his usual French press. He rose to greet me in the middle of the coffee shop. He held me as I sobbed. Um, eventually, my friend and I had coffee. Um, eventually, I filed for divorce. This is one part. These, um, This part, I would... It feels a little weaker, the writing, than the rest. The the repetition of eventually. It's three. Guess the rule of three there. Um, eventually, my friend and I had coffee. I would like a little more description of what the conversation was like. Just feel the scene a little more. There's a sort of a distant distance to how the scene is described here. Um, eventually, I filed for divorce. So eventually, my son forgave me for not taking him with me. And you can see it loses some of the music, too. Um, just the way it's read is, is much more like the register shifts from a sort of a poetic flow to kind of a, a choppy summarizing voice. And so I think this stanza could be a little more spruced up. Um, Ten years later, I told my friend for a second that day. I think the second is a little confusing, too. Um, that day, I felt ambushed. Because we know what, you know, um, ten years later, I told my friend. 
I, mean, I don't know, for a moment is maybe better, but I don't know. Um, he explained once someone gave him the hours that it had righted his course, that you have to decide to stay in that time of unhappiness or be brave enough to start over. And that, that's definitely the ending. Um, Dick Westheimer says, yeah, maybe give friend a name. Um, yeah, I think maybe give friend more of ident- an identity. Yeah, I think that that might be the thing that that it's it loses a little bit of its um. It, it just feels like there's a distance there, and if the friend had a name, I think that's a good suggestion. So thanks, Dick, for that. Um, if the friend had a name, we wouldn't have to say the friend and my friend and and refer to it that way all the time. Um, it could also be a you. You know, the, you know, a lot of times I, uh, we talk here about how it's difficult to do a second-person poem uh, because you get the ambiguity. We don't really, as a reader, know who you're talking about. I um, mean, you can play with that, or you, but a lot of times it just ends up being confusing and, and leads to sort of the muddling of the writing. Um, but in this, this, this might be the perfect um, kind of poem for second-person, was what I was thinking, is that, um, you know, write this as a letter to the friend. And then and, and tell the story in the same kind of way, um, but let us know right up right up front that it's um you know a letter to this friend, um, and then and then we'll get in addition to the 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 uh, the honesty that we're kind of drawn to, you also get this sort of intimacy because you're speaking at least in your mind to the actual person, and we're kind of in addition to being honest, it's also intimate, and so I think this is the perfect kind of poem to be in the second person. Um, you know, when you handed me this copy of The Hours, I didn't know then it was a setup. You just said the writing was beautiful. You knew that I'd read some Virginia Woolf, though not Mrs. Dalloway. You knew I was struggling in my marriage. See how that, that feels? There's a difference to that. And, and so if we know that we're talking to a specific person, then it just draws us in even more to this poem. So that was, that's my main suggestion. Um, and I think you'd run through the whole poem like that, and it might help clarify this sections where it was a little weaker. Um, cause if you, if you really think like you, I, I've talked about this before a lot, but R- Rattle was founded out of, um, these method writing workshops, which is kind of like method acting where you inhabit the character and, and what you're really doing when you're writing a poem is inhabiting a voice. And, and so if, and, and you can think of yourself as actually, even if it's not a letter you're going to give to somebody, even if you're like fictionalizing it, you can imagine actually writing it to the person and inhabit the voice of somebody who would be writing a letter like this. And I think the poem would just pop out of the page if you, you know, I think it'd be great if you, if you did that, that'd be my main suggestion. And I think you could tell the story. I think you don't have to change much. Um, just sort of rewrite it again. Like I was saying before, start over, um, you know, just start typing, but type it, you know, translate it into second person as you go and change what you, you know, let yourself be free to change and flow a little bit with the poem. And maybe that'll be better. Um, yeah, James Langford says the writer fills out the friend character a bit because the friend is still there as a friend 10 years later. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think... Yeah, and so Katie Dozer says that's a great idea as it feels like it's trying to tell the friend all this anyway. Yeah, exactly. And so we get this feeling of being in on this this close relationship thing and this really important story um, that we get to learn from ourselves too um, while you know, ha- experiencing that... that that friendship too. So it adds a whole another layer to it. I think it works really well that way. And you can even hear it, you know, just reading it with that simple translation of the first stanza into second person. So that's what I would do with this one. Anyway, a very interesting poem. I enjoyed this. Um, a lot of, uh, this is one of those kind of easy critique type poems because it's easy to say lop off the <laughs> lop off the last stanza and write the thing in second person. Um, very easy rewrite actually. So I hope you do. Hope you, uh, hope that helps. And now we have uh, 15 minutes for the last poet and um and these are two short poems this is bronwyn drew bronwyn drew poetry priesthood there are high priests in the temples of poetics they set up dogma and point out sinners sinners violate the poetry creed one shall not write poems about poetry ones with mfas set the theology the rules professors of politics and poetry of the male gender know best Better to ridicule, ridicule than to offer helpful suggestions. Don't nurture, just deride and torture. Um, 
Yeah, so that is, a, that is a very short poem, The Poetry Priesthood. And it's very interesting to me. I have very conflicting feelings about, um, about this kind of argument. Because in a way, you know, it's, it's one of those things where it's partly true that there is this kind of sort of academic convention thing, that, kind of a rut that we get into. Like I had, I, I've mentioned this many times before, but I had a, po- a professor, um, you know, say that rhyming is dead. There's no rhyming in my classroom. And that was in college. Um, or, or, you know, just don't submit rhyming poems here. And like, what? So there's a way that that does feel like the priesthood. But on the other hand, um, you know, the thing about about these rules, they're not rules that we, um, you know, that we set the theology and the rules. Um, you know, it, it, they're like um, they're like building principles, you know, and and so a poem is like building a house or something, you know, and and you can look at a poem and say, hey, the roof is going to leak, <laughs> and um, you know, and, and in the real house, the roof would actually leak. And there'd be no denying it. But in a in a poetry, there's this way because it's it's sort of there's a subjective nature to it. It's an art, so we give it a lot more flexibility. And so it's a lot harder to admit that the roof is leaking um, than if you know if you're like woodworking and you build a chair, you sit on it and you fall over because you didn't have enough support. <laughs> then uh, there's no denying that. But there's a lot of you can deny um, deny things in poetry, and they're just principles that work with the way language works and the way evolutionary psychology works, the way our brains developed, um, the, the way speaking and storytelling operate. Um, there are just a lot of principles that, that the advice that you get in these workshops, um, are, are grounded in reality. And it's not just a matter of, um, high priests making up rules that you have to, you know, an orthodoxy that you have to follow. Um, they're, they're suggestions for actually, like, constructing something that will hold up um and, and last and it's very easy to deny that um you know because you you know you wrote your thing and you usually say oh these are just priests saying some orthodoxy that i don't have to follow you know young you know poets starting out do that all the time they say well this is the way i'm writing and um and it just doesn't work kind of you know i mean it's just it's not the kind of thing that will stay with people because there are ways that our brains work in the ways that we receive storytelling and language so um, so anyway, I'm very conflicted because on the one hand, you know, Rattle was founded to be something that, that you don't have to be an academic with an MFA or a PhD to appreciate poetry. It's for everybody. We try to include everybody in, in writing and sharing poems. And so I, I appreciate the metaphor of the high priesthood, but I'm also very, very, you know, wary of it as well. But anyway, let's look at the poem in a little more detail. Poetry, priesthood. There are high priests in the temples of poetics. I love that first line. That's really good. It really, you know, we jump right in. We know what we're talking about. It's a, we know it's, you know, you see it's going to be a pretty short poem, but you know what it's about. And then we get an image right away that draws us in. They set up dogma and point out sinners. Sinners violate the poetry creed. One should not write poems about poetry. And that is one thing, too, that people, that, that that's one of the things that I agree is sort of a creed that, um, and, and I think that, that the poetry priests say this because they get tired. You get tired of hearing the same kind of things, you know. And so you tell people, oh, you know, don't write poems about poetry just because you don't want to hear more poems about poetry yourself. But there can be great poems about poetry. So I, I like that. Um, ones with the MFAs set the theology, the rules, professors of poetics and poetry of the male gender know best. Better to ridicule than to offer helpful suggestions don't nurture, just deride and torture. I love the, um, did I mention it before? This, there's a nice little rhyme there. Don't nurture, just deride and torture. Um, but yeah, so so this is exactly what I was going to say. This is Clayton Clark's comment. Feels didactic to me. I'd like to see it open up. And yeah, exactly. So I was hoping when I got to poetry priesthood, um, there are high temples or high priests in the temples of poetics. That's a great setup for a poem. And then instead of fixing on that image and, and sort of pushing that further, I mean, it's sort of showing what your message is, what you're sharing, what your thoughts are through that idea of priests. It it moves into this didactic space where you're just saying, like, the priests do this and this and this, and aren't they bad? Um, if you could show us that, you know, I mean, you could make this, there's a lot of directions you could go with a setup. It could be a funny direction where you're showing us things they're doing that are funny as you describe what the the priests and the temples of poetics do. Um you know, there, if if you just ex, if you focus on expanding this image and letting that metaphor become an extended metaphor and push out through the poem, it'll be a lot more engaging and memorable. I think so. It was a really good setup, and then it became too too preachy um, at the end. Let's see. 
Yeah, so this is, yeah, Dick Westheimer, more rhetoric than poetry, to me, important as the message is. Yeah, so what we really want to do is just, I really think it's a great setup. I, I wouldn't get rid of this poem, but I think um, once you get to the they, it's almost like when you have this they, um, you know, this is something that um, conspiracy theorists do a lot. Um, you know, they, the man, you know, the, we, we don't really say like they are controlling the whatever. And so do you have this sort of disembodied sense of what, what people are like, um, you know, it's, it's, it's so imprecise that you don't really know how to characterize it. Um, your concept of who these people actually are, like, who is they, like, who's the actual person? Is it David Rockefeller? <laughs> I don't know. So, so saying that they, um, is like sort of the wrong turn, I think, here. And once you say they and you start saying that they do this and they do that, it loses the specificity of the priests. Um, and, then, and then it turns into didactic, didacticism. So that's the spot. Like, that's the turn where it made the wrong turn. Like, the poem, the, the road was this way and, and it went off the, the, the hill there, I think. Um, yeah. Okay, so um, I think that might be all I have to say about this. It's a good setup, and um, I, I'd like to see it expanded. I'd like to see what the priests actually do. Um, you know, we have, like, the... Um, there's one poem we published called, like, the... Um, the Politics of Poetry or something like that, or the... It's this whole... Na the Nation of Poetry, maybe? I can't remember. Um, but it went through, like, poetry as politics in an interesting way. And, and that kind of reminds me of that. He'd go through and, and show these priests and tell the story. Um, oh, thanks. So Venus says it's probably true that very few poets critique with such compassion and kindness or mumbling as I do. Um, sounds like the poet has some bad experiences. Yeah, that's too bad. I think there are, you know, when I was an undergraduate, I, I mentioned that one professor I had who said, um, you know, no rhyme in this classroom. I had some other just nasty, you know, like about to retire people that didn't want to be there. Um, and we're really, you know, harsh. And I've heard a lot of stories about people who come out of a workshop crying. I hope nobody ever does that for ours. We're just trying to help. Um, but anyway, yeah. So, so I think that, you know, going with the priests is the way to go. Let's look at the other poem. There's one more, um, another short one from Branwyn Drew. Semicolon or period. April 2018. That same year. I guess it's a popular year. What was happening in 2018? It seems like another another world, doesn't it? Before the pandemic and before, you know, politics went completely off the rails. Um, semicolon or period. Let's start over. Semicolon or period. April 2018. What can I use? Where can I do it? Between Rome and home? Will it be fast? Will it hurt? Will anyone understand? Will it be missed? Will anyone care? Choices, the semicolon, the period. April 2022, I choose the semicolon. My sentence is not done. And then it ends, if you can't, if the resolution's not high enough, it ends with a semicolon there. So it's, you know, so it's going to continue. Um, I think this is, again, this is an interesting concept. Um, and again, I think it goes off the rails by being too didactic or too, you know, too... Um, um yeah so yeah it's too too preachy you know um too too heavy-handed i guess is another way to put it um and in, instead of fixing you know sticking with like the images and stuff um we get this sort of telling us what you want us to think which is not it's not a, a way that you know poetry persuades but poetry persuades in and in an undercut you know uh, you know a uh, it persuades through empathy and for understanding what, what your position is and sort of inhabiting your body. Cause when we're sharing a poem, your breath is becoming my breath and I'm like becoming you in a weird way. Like my breathing is regulated in the same way that yours is, as you're writing. It's a strange transference. And then we get the, the speaker is me, you know, the voice I'm reading is also the speaker's voice. So there's this very intimate transferal of things. And, and, and the, so the way poetry persuades is by undercutting, all that and, and letting you inhabit somebody else. And then you learn something about like what it's like to be them. And then it changes your, your mind about things that way. But to, to be sort of preaching at you, it doesn't really work um, for the same reason, because, you know, preaching at somebody, uh, you know, when you're inhabiting the preaching, you're, it, it just doesn't work. So, um, so yeah, so it becomes too preachy and didactic. The thing, so semicolon period is a cool concept though. Um, I like that idea. And I, I would like it if um, 
you know, you had this as a title and didn't really mention it again till the end where it does. And you're like, ah, like that works. I think that works. Um, um, so, he, so I think that that's a good concept and title. Um, um, April, 2018, this is something that we just don't know what it is. Um, Nancy Sobinick says uh, this one reads like it is a metaphor about contemplation of suicide. And that was my interpretation, too. I think that, you know, do I put a period at the end or a semicolon, um, you know, at, at a hard time in life? I think that that's a really powerful thought. And it seems like that's what the poem is about, even though it doesn't say. Um, let's see. Interesting. So, so Dick Westerman says, I was told by an editor convening a workshop that he'd never, ever include a poem that used gerunds. No INGs. The next poem I wrote was a song of verbals and gerunds. I let it, his certainty wash over me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so April 2018, what can I use? Where can I do it? And so that does seem like, th that's why I thought it was a, you know, suicidal ideation. Like, what can I use and where, would I, where should I do it? Between Rome and home. This is the, the only image really in the poem between Rome and home. And it, it's a very subtle, you know, slight image too, but we get Rome, which is a concrete detail. And I feel like the poem could, instead of be, will it fast, will it hurt, will anyone understand, will it be missed, will anyone care, these abstractions. Um, if we focused on this between Rome and home and use that as a, as a repetition, kind of repetitive springboard, um, you know, so between Rome and home, between this and between this, you know, will I use this word? It can become a list poem out of this really, really easily, I think. Um, and, and, and be, but be specific and concrete about it. So, you know, Rome is a specific detail. Um, you know, so between Rome and home, between this place and this place, you know, with this or with that, like you could move on and, and generate actual images and concrete ideas and objects that sort of tell the story through here without having to go into this abstraction. Um, will it be fast? Will it hurt? Will anyone understand? Will I be missed? Will anyone care? I and mean, then they're, um, they're just not as engaging because they don't have the concrete images tying to them. Um, and then I think, you know, and then I wouldn't do this. I would let the title, you know, the title stand there and then get to the end. I think it would work. In the end, I chose a semicolon. My sentence is not done and then ended that way. It's kind of, I like that. So that's probably what I would do with this poem is focus on this line and expand that. Like get that into some kind of list where you're generating creative things out of your subconscious. I mean, that's kind of what we often want to try to do with a poem is to, to make things come out that we didn't know or, you know, and then you transfer that onto somebody else and they understand what it was like to be in your subconscious. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's my suggestion for this poem. But again, there's a really great concept behind this poem, um, as with the other poem too, I thought, um, you know, so there's a, there's a lot of fun you could do, but I think yeah, as Angela Gardner says, it needs more detail, and it's you know we talk about this all the time. You know, repeating myself for the regulars here, but but um, but emotion lives in specificity, and it's because of that that magical experience of the you know the speaker's voice becoming my breath, and so we, we think that being general helps because we can all relate. Um, you know, it's a stuff more general because it won't be specific. It's, it's easier to relate to, but that's exactly the opposite of how poetry actually operates. So I'm in, you know, someone else's voice is inhabiting my body. And so when I become, when I see specific details and concrete items and things that make me feel it's a specific place, it enhances that effect of me becoming someone else so I can learn what it's like to be them. So the concrete details, the spec specif specific things that you don't... Uh, you think we might not relate to is what actually makes us relate. It's like a, it's a counterintuitive thing, but it's true. So, so going, so st starting between home, Rome and home, which has a nice little rhyme there, which sort of kicked you off. Um, making a list out of that, that becomes very specific. will add that detail that Angela Gardner mentions is missing. Um, and I think is what's actually missing from the poem, which is otherwise a good concept. Um, so, so thanks for sharing that. That has been perfectly the hour. I was wondering if we'd squeeze all five poems in, but we did. You know, we had the semicolon or period. We had the priesthood. Uh, those were Bronwyn Drew. We had the, uh, it's been a good good hour. We had the, the Jean or Jean or Jean Blum. Some things shift. And I'm sorry that I'm very ignorant about names sometimes. I have some, some quirks <laughs> in my, my own brain. Um, I say the wrong word sometimes too. Some things shift. And um, 
this one, which I would retitle as Ocean City in October, probably. And then Kids Will Ruin Your uh, Kids Will Ruin Your Figure, which is a great, great blank verse sonnet. So good stuff here. Thanks for sharing these. It was really fun to go over them. Um, before we go, let me uh, flip over to the old. Uh, <laughs> let's let's refresh. So we were on. Let's see how my day is going to be going. Twenty nine thirty two. Let's refresh and see where we are. 2982. So so almost a submission a minute for the last uh for the last hour. So that's that's how how much they come in at this time of uh on this day. Like they just half of them come in the last day. So um so that's why it's such an important day for me and there's still uh now 14 hours left if you're if you're thinking about yours that is the rattled poetry prize of course anyway that is the critique of the week thanks everybody for joining me it's been a lot of fun i had a it was a good a good one this week i like all the poems something to say about all of them which is which is fun so this week's guest i already mentioned on the rattlecast or, or next week i guess is going to be uh anna m evans and she has a book uh, under dark Waters: surviving the titanic she has another chat book that she's going to be sharing some poems from called the quarantina chronicles um the cor- so uh the so Dark Waters is from Abel Muse, which we talked about. Quarantine is from Barefoot Muse. Um, two presses that do uh, that do formal stuff. So if you're into formal poetry, those are the two main presses that you want to look at. Um, anyway, um, Under Dark Waters, Surrounding the Titanic. Um, this is going to be an interesting book to talk about. Um, Anna Evans is also the editor. Now she took over for Kim Bridgeford, I think. It, um, another word I can't pronounce. There's so many words I can't pronounce. Mezzo, mezzo common. Or mesocamine. I'm not sure how you're supposed to say that. Um, but let me show you this. If you're not familiar, um, or mezzo, um, hang on a second. Let me let me show you this. If you're not familiar with this, this is um, where is it? Let me find the website. I don't know why the website's not coming up. It's Mezzo coming. It's a, it's a it's a great literary magazine for um for women. There it is. Mezzo Mezzo Mezzocommon.com. So she is now the editor of this Mezzocommon.com, an online journal of formalist poetry by women. So um you can tell formalism is uh the theme here with Anna. Um but check out this website, Mezzo Mezzo Common. It's spelled like it's on the screen there. Um dot com. She just brought the new issue. It was Kim Kim Bridgeford, who I interviewed for Rattle Number. 63 i think but unfortunately she passed away from breast cancer not too maybe two years ago we had a poem um um in memory in memoriam of her um when that happened about two years ago um but but anna evans is a poet who took that over so um check that out she's gonna be the guest with a couple of interesting books as well um on this week's rattlecast so hope to join us then the regular time uh, Monday, July 18th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. And the prompt for the week is to write a poem about the movie you've seen the most number of times. So a movie you watch over and over again. Um, I'm not sure which movie I'm going to pick. I can't I don't have to do the math. I'm, I think it might be. I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out. We'll surprise you. But that is the guest for the week and the prompt for the week for Rattlecast 142. Hope to see you then. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime. And I will talk to you later. Goodbye. Thank mm-hmm. you.